And we are live. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Madnick, and I am the vice president of the Foundation for Less Virgin of Schools. On behalf of the Foundation for Less Virgin of Schools, I want to thank you for joining us uh, for tonight's Parenting Through Pandemic Town Hall. One of the pillars of the foundation's mission is providing support for the mental health and wellness of our district students, families, and staff. Uh, we do this by providing funds to increase the number of counselors who are available to help students, families, and staff in times when they suffer mental and emotional challenges. We believe that our students can thrive when they're afforded the space to learn. Um, with that in mind, we know that uh, all the parents in the district um, have experienced unprecedented challenges over the last year. So we put together this incredible panel of professionals who have firsthand experience providing care to members of our community to discuss the past, present, and future of parenting through the pandemic. Hopefully tonight you will come away with some new information and tools that will help you in your daily life. You'll hear that you're not alone in your parenting challenges and you'll come away with a positive outlook as we finally start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, before I hand this over to Rich Lopez, I wanna extend a huge thank you to our, uh, to our panel on behalf of the foundation um, who have all volunteered their time here this evening. I also wanna thank everyone at the district, uh, including Jim Klein, Ryan Gleason, and Dan Stepanowski, who uh, provided us with the support that we needed to put this evening together. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Rich. Great, thank you, Mark. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you to the foundation and to the district for putting this together. I think this is a great idea and I'm, I'm really proud to be part of it. Uh, before we do introductions, you know, I mean, before we get into the questions, I just wanted to have all of us introduce ourselves and tell you a little about, about us. My name is Rich Lopez. I'm a teacher at Calabasas High School, been there about 10 years, been teaching for about 20 years in total. I also have two kids in the district. I have a son, a senior, and a daughter, a freshman at Agora High School. So I am, had, uh, had the pleasure this year of, of seeing all of this from, from both sides, both as a teacher and as a student. I mean, a teacher and a parent um, of students. So Mona. Uh, hi, I'm Mona White and I'm a counselor with the Community 360 Counseling Center. I've worked for Las Virgenes for 17 yeah. years. Um, I'm also a licensed marriage and family uh, therapist, but LA. in this role, I am uh, strictly a, a school counselor and supporting students, parents and um, faculty mm -hmm. in the district. Nicole? Oh, you're on mute. Hi, my name is Nicole Collier, and this is my third year working for the district and my second year working at the Community 360 Counseling Center. I split my time there um, as well as at Chaparral Elementary School, and I'm really happy to be here. Al? Hi, my name is Al Ludington. I'm a marriage and family therapist and the executive director of the Ludington Institute for Family Enrichment. I'm uh, I've been blessed to work with your school district for 40 years. I started when I was three. And uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, I work both with Nicole and Mona and Dan and Ryan and the foundation and have for years and feel so grateful for all your school district does with the kids. I realize after our introduction and, you know, when Jason and Mona and Nicole and Richard and I met last week, I had such parent envy. Um, that y'all have kids in the school district, that they're thriving, whether they're in elementary, middle, or high schools um, in Las Virginias. It's an amazing school district, and I'm just grateful to work with it, So, uh, and I'm pleased to be with y'all today. Dr. Bromberg. Hi, guys. I'm Jason Bromberg. I'm thrilled to be here and honored to be here with you guys tonight. Um, I'm a general pediatrician. I work at Agoura West Valley Pediatrics. I've been working uh, as a pediatrician for 21 years. Uh, we have an office in uh, Agoura and one in West Hills, so I see a lot of your kids um, and a lot of kids in the district. Uh, I have uh, three boys. Um, I have one at University of Michigan, one who's going to Michigan next year, and then I have a seventh grader who, sadly, uh, his brothers will force him to go to Michigan when he's ready. Um, 
but uh, I'm a doctor, but yes, I'm a doctor, but I'm a parent first. And so all the things you're feeling and all the anxiety you've been feeling over the past year and the frustrations, I feel that too. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this panel to, to talk it out with everyone. Great. So uh, the foundation requested people to send in questions and we received a bunch and we went through them and sort of organized them. But before we get into the questions, we're gonna start with just a little overview from Dr. Bromberg and Al about what they're seeing and also some of the misconceptions that they're out, are out there about COVID and also what's been going on in the past year. Dr. Bromberg, you wanna start? So we'll, we'll get into a lot of the things I'm seeing. I wanted to start with some of the myths, the big myths that I've seen in my office that I hear from patients. And these are these are real things that, that parents have, have asked me or even some kids have asked me and what they hear. So, and we'll get into a lot more detail in these later tonight. Um, but I talked about five myths. And uh, the first one, COVID vaccines were developed too fast to be safe. And just know the technology used to develop the mRNA vaccines isn't new. It's been around for decades. The technology used for the viral vector vaccines um, which are another type of vaccine has also been used for decades. Clinical trials during the development of COVID vaccines use the exact same rigor used for all other trials. So this one, this is truly a myth as are the other four. Number two, there weren't enough clinical trial participants to say the vaccine is safe. This is false. And I hear this a lot. Tens of thousands of participants were studied and were followed for two months after receiving the second dose, which is standard for all vaccine studies. The vaccine will alter my DNA. That's a big one. And that's false. It's not possible. The mRNA vaccine works in the cell cytoplasm. That's part of the cell. It never enters the nucleus. The nucleus is where the DNA lives. The mRNA is broken down immediately after entering the cell. So it's impossible for these vaccines to, to impact the DNA. The fourth I hear is, uh, you, you may laugh at this, but I hear this plenty. COVID, uh, COVID-19 vaccines will develop a microchip into my body. This rumor started after discussion of a digital vaccine record where COVID vaccines can be tracked. These vaccines have absolutely no electronic components. And then a big one that everyone deals with, the last one, the last myth, I don't need to wear a mask after I'm vaccinated and I can't get COVID after I'm fully vaccinated. We know the COVID vaccine protects you from getting seriously ill, but you can still get COVID. Gosh, Dr. Bromberg, I already feel a lot better. Uh, <laughs> I thought my DNA was already altered. Uh, you know, the other thing I wanna say on my side of the fence is I deal with mental health. And um, most all of you listening to this podcast have either submitted or been concerned about the mental health in our community and how COVID has affected it. So I wanted to express a couple of myths. Number one, suicides are down in 2020, not up. They're down. Researchers, um, the, the myth that re suicides were up really was a political campaign kind of myth that grew out. But there was an article in the LA Times two Sundays ago that just reported myths are down among teenagers and young adults, which by the way, we are very grateful for. Number two, that COVID-19 and the absence of going to school has caused anxiety disorders. Not going to school did not create anxiety disorders. What create the anxiety disorder in kids is the loss of the illusion of safety. Now, most all of us have struggled with losing the illusion of safety. Now, I use that word very carefully, but safety is an illusion. We're sitting here tonight on a Zoom call on the San Andreas Fault. We have the illusion that we're safe. There's been a drought for a year. We don't smell smoke. We have the illusion of safety. Some of y'all fly. And when you fly at 30,000 feet, that's six miles high at 600 miles an hour, they give you this little nylon belt and they tell you here, you can float on this flotation device and you'll be fine. They create the illusion of safety for you. What COVID did is for many of us, it took away our illusion of safety. And because we didn't know how to feel safe, we weren't able to pass that on to our children, our young people. So we're going to talk in a little while, um, as Dr. Bromberg was referring, he's been treating a lot of kids with these anxiety issues and somatic disorders that are caused by anxiety. But the myth of 
The anxiety was created by COVID is not it. The myth was created. We lost the illusion of safety. And third and final myth, as far as mental health, is that this, kids will suffer from this for years to come. This is simply a myth because we don't know. We have no research and no data about prolonged mental health recovery given the severity of a global pandemic. It happened over 100 years ago, but we don't have research and data uh, in mental health care to tell us about that. So we're looking more for true data about how this pandemic has affected our young people as parents, how it's affected us as adults, how it's affected marriages, and we'll have a better idea of the outcome in 18 to 36 months than we have currently. So thank you. Richard, your, your mic's off. Sorry, I turned that off. Sorry, thank you. Some of the questions we received were about uh, our kids are gonna start getting the vaccine. Uh, Dr. Romer, could you talk a little bit about that and the safety of the vaccine for, 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 for our kids? So oh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a question I get uh, almost every Monday. <coughs> when will kids be getting the, the COVID vaccine? Children are low risk groups for complications from COVID which that made them the lowest priority when it came to vaccine distribution. Most children with COVID have mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. However, some may get extremely ill from this virus. Children represent 13% of all COVID cases in the US and at least 268 kids, healthy kids have died from COVID since last March. That's over 40% more than die from the flu every year. Additionally, over 13,000 kids have been hospitalized and we've seen over 3,500 cases of that childhood inflammatory syndrome that you've heard about, MISC, since the pandemic, the pandemic started. It's therefore crucial to have vaccines available to kids to curb the spread of the disease. Additionally, many believe that if we want to reach herd immunity, and that's the point at which enough of the population is protected against COVID to stop its spread, we need children inoculated. Children 18 and older make up 25% of the US population. So if children aren't being vaccinated, it's unlikely that we get community protection. We need, to, we need to protect children, but we must do it safely. The fact is this vaccine has undergone the most intense safety monitoring in the history of US vaccines. As you know, the pharmaceutical companies are currently conducting vaccine trials involving thousands of children aged six months to 15 years. Pfizer just announced that their vaccine is safe and strongly protective in 12 to 12 and kids 12 to 15 years old. In fact, its data show this vaccine to be 100% effective in this age group. According to the Pfizer statement, the vaccine was well tolerated with side effects similar to those seen in the 16 to 25 year olds in the adult, adult trial and included the, 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 the normal side effects that you'd think about that you got probably when you got the shot, injection site pain, headaches, fever, maybe some chills and fatigue. It's anticipated that the Pfizer vaccine will be reviewed for emergency use authorization for this age group very soon. And with Moderna, who has had trials of children 12 to 17 years old since December to follow shortly. This means that we may have a vaccine for this age group in the next few months. Additionally, Pfizer and Moderna have each launched clinical trials for COVID vaccines that involve children's, still children six months to 11 years. Pfizer plans to enroll more than 4,600 children and Moderna plans to enroll 6,750 children and their research. What will these trials look like? The good news is that the drug companies don't have to repeat the entire adult trial. COVID clinical trials in young people are being designed and organized appropriately so that there's a balance between the rapid need for results and the even more important factor safety. Basically, they're looking at how tolerable the vaccine is to kids and at what doses, as kids tend to have a more robust immune system. They're checking antibody levels to, to ensure that the antibodies produced against COVID-19 are protective and stay in the body long enough. Researchers are not sure when vaccines will become available to children. So much depends on the results of the clinical trials and also the FDA approval status. But here's, here's what everyone wants to know. If they go as anticipated, 12 to 15 year olds may be eligible for a vaccine very soon. I've heard anywhere, I've heard anywhere between late spring, maybe May and early fall through maybe September. Five to 11 year olds by the end of 2021 to the beginning of 2022 and infants to age four during the first half of 20, uh, 2022. So 12 to, your 12 to 15 year olds may be getting the vaccine in the next one to three months. All right, uh, Al, 
Can you talk just a little bit about uh, some of the things you have seen an increase of this, this past year as far as depression, anxiety, what, what you've been seeing in your clinic? Yeah, I'd be glad to. And again, Jason, I think you deserve a network spot. Uh, <laughs> that was great information. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the thing that I would mention first is, again, we've seen a, a, an increase in anxiety disorders among children, um, anxiety disorders sh showing up in sleep disruption, uh, slowing up in um, stomach, somatic disorders, headaches. We've seen it show up in um, uh, things like uh, chronic irritation, uh, agitation, uh, a little bit sometimes uh, more. What, what we, so we've seen that, but what we really have seen is any existing psychological problem in a kid uh, that pre-existed COVID elevated. So it was like uh, somebody turned up the burner of the pre, so if somebody was ADHD before, they were really ADHD. If somebody was a little bit anxious, they were really anxious. If somebody, especially our middle school kids and uh, high school kids who uh, suffered from um, some body dysmorphic conditions or problems with eating disorders, that increased. Surprisingly enough though, Richard, what we did see is a decline for some kids that had, for example, social anxiety. They weren't needing to be social, so it reduced. We found some kids who had experienced bullying and the desire to isolate through the Zooming, it actually decreased uh, some of their symptomatology. So in our children cases, those were the big ones that we saw, and we saw an elevation. We did see a decrease in things like, I said, suicidal ideation. We saw a decrease in cutting and self-harming. So some of the more acute symptoms that we would see coming in had actually diminished a little bit. Sometimes those symptoms are, are exacerbated by peer relationships and peer cultures. So by decreasing peer exposure, some of those sort of were downplayed. In our adult population, we saw a tremendous increase in stress. Um, I told you all last week when we met, for those of you adults um, listening, Stress in an adult world is when we lose the illusion of control and predictability. How many, uh, today I was watching uh, NBC News um, and I saw all these parents relieved. Why? All of them said, we're getting back to a regimen, a regime. They're having a sense of control again. When COVID hit, they lost the illusion of control. They lost the illusion of controlling the virus. They didn't know if they could go to the store. They couldn't find toilet paper. Um, and predictability, they didn't know when the kids would go to school. They didn't know if they'd have a job. They didn't know if the economics were there. So we saw a real spike in uh, adults' symptoms around stress, sleep problems. Adults, it probably you've read, increased alcohol consumption that, uh, um, Alcohol, hard alcohol increased 40% consumption during the COVID virus, an increase in weight. A lot of my clients are talking about their COVID-19. So they had stress eating and they didn't have a way to lose it. And we also saw in our adult population, a decrease in finding pleasurable activities, meaning that they weren't going to the movies. They weren't uh, gathering with friends. They weren't being sexual amongst each other in a relationship. They weren't dating if they were single. So the adult population had a certain bandwidth that our children weren't suffering from because mainly the complexities of their life. But those are just the sort of a spattering of the increased things. And those who were, for example, when we talk about the increase in distilled alcohol intake, we saw slipping among drug and alcohol abuse. People were having a hard time maintaining sobriety. Uh, by the way, one thing that decreased is infidelity in the area. Uh, with COVID, everybody was staying home and people weren't acting outside their relationship. So there was just a whole cluster of things that we discovered. Um, and our community, you know, presented with quite a few. Uh, our offices have been open since the virus started and we are operating at 98% full, all COVID. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to, to, to note one of the things that you said, then this is a nice segue into our next section, sort of about going back to school. 
um, you know, there were for many, many people, this, this raised their level of anxiety, raised their level of stress, but there was a certain population for whom it alleviated a few stressors. Um, and I think that is a nice segue into the next section where we talk about what we're seeing now, uh, getting back into the classroom. Although, you know, for our ele elementary kids, they've been back in the classroom for, for six months. Um, the reopening of schools, there was a lot of anxiety around the safety of that. Um, and I, one of the questions we were asked, are kids having to relearn being back in the classroom? And I think it's a great question um, because they don't need to relearn how to be back in the classroom, but this was another level of anxiety. This was another level of, of stress. It was a change in schedule. It's nice to get back to this regimen. And that's been the nicest thing to have them be back on campus. They're there seeing us every day. They know what to do when they're there. Um, but our schedules have had, had been altered so much and then to alter them again to get back on campus, I think that presented a whole nother series of stressors and anxiety. Um, Mona and Nicole, if you could talk a little bit about just what you've seen on your end from that about kids getting back into the classroom and if that's raised uh, a little, some issues for you where, where you guys work. What I've noticed um, with the kids is that's funny because Al was talking about social anxiety decreasing during the pandemic. Um, but I'm actually seeing an increase with social anxiety with the kids that are coming back to school now, because the ones that are really thriving that didn't have to worry about the peer relations um, are afraid to come back. I also am working with kids who are feeling um, worried that they're not going to um, live up to their teacher's expectations because they've been doing, you know, Zoom learning for so long that they're afraid, oh my gosh, I'm not sure if I've learned everything I need to and I'm afraid for that. Um, so I definitely have seen anxiety as the kids are coming back, but I've also seen, especially among the elementary school, so many happy kids. Kids are happy to be back and to be seeing each other. It's been really nice to see. But, but one could be happy and also feel stress, right? I mean, Absolutely. Those aren't separate emotions. I mean, I mean, they're separate emotions, but you can have both those things, right? Am I wrong in that? No, absolutely. I mean, you can you can be anxious about being back at school, um, what, but yet still enjoying the social aspect of it. And I think that's what I'm what I was talking about is right. seeing the no, kids. Absolutely. Social. Absolutely. Happy. The next question we were asked was about children who have very little motivation. Um, they're they're going through what they're going through. They're just not. They're just over it in regards to school. They they just can't find that motivation. Um, what, what would be some good advice to, to offer some parents to help their kids be a little bit more motivated? You know, we, we do feel like there is a light at the end of the tunnel here with the vaccines coming out, with us moving out of the pandemic. What, what might we suggest to some of these parents struggling with that as their kids go back into the classroom? Well, something I think it's really important for us as adults to remember is that our kids look to us to be um, their leaders, um, we're teaching them, we're training them. And most importantly, for us to kind of have hope and hold hope within ourselves and sort of that optimism is so important for our kids to see. So that I think is number one is as a parent sort of modeling hope and positivity. And now I'm gonna go old school, which is, I feel like it's so important for kids to um, have sort of a routine and have a rhythm to their lives. When, when the pandemic started, everyone was trying to figure out what to do. And, and Al is so right on the money with, you know, all of the adult stressors that parents were kind of trying to figure out how I'm going to work from home and have my kids and, you know, how am I going to do this? But now we have the opportunity to go back to creating a routine. What's, what is the rhythm of our life going to look like? And how do we sort of get back into that? That's really important. So I like um, families to consider, you know, what family activities are they, are they doing? Having dinner together, if possible, is really important. And um, the concern about taking away privileges, I know Nicole and I have talked about this question is kids, um, we want to make for sure that kids sort of earn privileges and that we don't just give it. So at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of kids were just going online because 
what were, were they going to do? And they're gaming for hours or whatever. And now we kind of can take a step back and go, okay, what is reasonable? What's appropriate? So that we can help our kids find a, a balance again. So it's really all about balance and, um, and connection. I'm going to follow that, Richard, because I, yeah. one misnomer that parents say is my kids is, isn't motivated. The fact is, is every child is motivated. It's just not usually the way in the area the parent wants them to be motivated. There's very rarely a child that isn't motivated these days to play a video game or a child that isn't motivated to watch TV or a child that isn't motivated to be on their social network or a child. So the key isn't, what do I do if my child isn't motivated? It's, I'm going to play off of Mona. It's how do I leverage what my kid is motivated in into what I'd like to transfer some of that motivation to an outcome. And when we end up shaming or guilting the area of motivation, we're going the wrong direction. Really, because they're motivated. I got kids motivated to play baseball and they could give a hoot about their studies. Well, how do I leverage their baseball into that? I have kids really motivated by Instagram. Okay, they're on it 24 seven. How do I leverage that into academic achievement, extracurricular activities? So in parenting, the creativity isn't the shame or guilt about them choosing an area different for motivation, but how do I get you to take some of this energy and put it over here? So yeah. I was playing off for years, Mona, so. Absolutely. I, I think we also brought up the, uh, we brought up Instagram, we brought up, you know, video games and all that stuff. I think it's a great time to bring up screen time. Obviously, the amount of time kids spend on their screens went through the roof this last year because we were doing our classes on Zoom, which I think we'll all agree. You spend a, a, an afternoon or a day on Zoom, you're tired. It, it changes you know, your outlook on things sometimes. Um, you know, it, it was difficult at times. It was very difficult for the, for the teachers to adjust to as well. Um, Dr. Robert, what, what are you seeing with kids in screen time? What are, what are some of the medical things we're seeing? It's a great question. All these questions, really, I hear, I hear every day, every single topic that's, that people have brought up so far. I think we all, as parents, have the exact same concerns. And screen time is a big one. By this point in the pandemic, setting rules around screen time may feel impossible. How much is too much? Does remote learning count? What about gaming with friends? And what if you, like many parents right now, are just too exhausted to fight it right now? There's no one right answer when it comes to managing screen time during the ongoing crisis. And we're fighting an uphill battle. Our brains are biologically wired to keep watching our screens. One theory is this, binging on screens triggers the release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter associated with pleasure. Dopamine travels to a part of the brain responsible for reinforcing behaviors called the nucleus accumbens. This drives people to watch more and more of what they love. I call the nucleus accumbens the immediate pleasure part of the brain. The frontal cortex then comes in to weigh the consequences of certain decisions, such as continuing to play video games or continuing to watch Netflix. A frontal cortex could say, it's time to stop watching or time to go exercise. I call the frontal cortex the self-control part of the brain. It's this daily battle between the immediate pleasure part of the brain versus the self-control part of the brain that challenges people and causes a lot of family stress. Although using a screen is definitely a safer option during the deadly pandemic compared to large get-togethers, it can also lead to a delay in social and emotional development. It's a daily battle that parents have. And I hear it from almost every parent, every appointment, every day. If you feel like your child has too much screen time, you are not alone. So how do you figure out if there is a screen time problem? First, stop focusing on how long they're on the screens and see if the rest of their emotional, social, and daily needs are, are being met. Ask yourself, is my child sleeping enough and eating a relatively balanced diet? Are they getting any form of daily exercise? Are they spending some quality time with the family? Do they use screen time to keep in touch with friends? Are they showing motivation in school? We just talked about that and keeping up with assignments. If most of the answers to these questions are yes, then it's probably okay if they watch three extra episodes of The Office. However, if most of the answers are no, there could be other issues going on and it's probably time to intervene. So what can you do if you realize there's a problem? One, you're not gonna stop screen time, but you can improve the quality of their screen time. So how do you do that? Number one, they're gonna be on the screens. Have them connect with their family, have them FaceTime their aunts and uncles, have them make a TikTok video to send to their cousin who's in college. 
Two, stay social. Connecting with friends virtually isn't the preferred way to have a relationship, but it's still valuable. Encourage your kids to have lunch online with friends or even do homework together online. Three, they can also pursue hobbies and build skills. There are lots of kid-friendly activities online that can keep them active, active offline. One of my sons taught himself how to juggle during this pandemic. He learned it from YouTube. So besides the quality of screen time, you can also set reasonable limits and boundaries which aren't too strict or rigid. And how do you do that? Number one, show compassion. Let your kids know you understand that they need a break. It's a tough time to be a kid right now. You can offer additional screen time as a bonus. Try using extra screen time as an incentive for good behavior. You and your child can even write down goals and rewards. Make a checklist. Brainstorm alternatives. When we tell kids that they can't do something, such as being on their phone, we need to give them alternatives what they can do instead. Fourth, keep a schedule. It's fair to set specific times where kids can be on their screens without hearing, get off your phones from us. And five, this is a big one. Well, actually it's a big one, but the next one's even bigger. Expect to be tested. You'll get a lot of resistance and maybe even anger when you set up a screen time plan. They will test you, but if you stay firm, their resistance will likely fade. And then model healthy screen use. Your children watch you. You lose credibility if you tell your children that they're on their phones too much, but then they see you texting at the dinner table. Please don't expect yourself to be a perfect parent during this crazy time. It's an impossible goal. If being a little less strict about your previous screen time rules gives you time to exercise, work, connect with family or friends, or just have some time to yourself, not only is it okay, it's preferred and better for your family in the long run. I want to jump in on just a couple of things. those things again, uh, Dr. Brimble, great stuff. Looking at the balance of the child's life, not the hours on the screen. Um, the good thing about being really old here is the dopamine center stimulation for kids and the balance between prefrontal cortex has manifested in my kids on the phone too long. Not the cell phone, by the way, guys, the one with the cords. Parents who obsessed that their kids were in their car too much. Parents who really were worried about the dopamine stimulation created by televisions. People who, if you go back generation to generation, there's been an object of parental concern for the dopamine uh, elevation and the fear of being addicted. We do not have rehab centers for teens because they watch too much video. The second thing, and I totally agree with Dr. Blumberg, is that I really hope every family goes at a zero time with um, phones, meaning it, we encourage from five to nine in every home, there not be any laptops, any uh, video games or any phones. And we also encourage at 9.30 to 10 o'clock, everybody has to check their cell phones in at night, meaning that kids don't go to bed with cell phones. Nobody has an iPad in the room. Everybody, because sleep deprivation is one of the greatest interferences that, uh, that, that occurs uh, with all this uh, screen time. So almost like a household rules. And by the way, when we recommend this, parents have a harder time with it than the kids. <laughs> so it, it, it really um, is a good thing for an entire family to practice as everybody off their electronics for a set amount of time, especially during mealtime. And at a nighttime, everything shuts down and everybody at six in the morning can have their phones back. Thanks. I, I fully agree. I mean, we've watched the phenomenon of screens come into the classroom and many teachers lamented and, and others have, have really utilized it, but it's, it's the idea of managing it. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we've seen is, is as soon as a lesson's over, the kids grab their screen and they're looking at something else or they're, or they're, they're dealing with their screens. And, and the, as you mentioned, it's not going away. No one, we're suddenly not gonna get rid of technology. So looking at how can we integrate this that's, that's what we've been focusing on in the classroom, tr trying to find ways that we can integrate the technology that the kids are using into our lessons. Like you said, maybe making some TikTok videos, doing different things and using the technology in a productive way as opposed to an unproductive way. And th that's a great way to look at it. Um, I'd like to sort of switch gears here and get into a little bit about what are some of the things that the district is offering? What are some of the things that, that we can do for our kids that really are struggling, that really need some, some mental support? Mona and Nicole, if we could turn to you a little bit about what are some of the things they can do? How do they book counseling appointments? What's available to them right now if our students are struggling with their social mental health? 
Yeah, so um, I know one of the questions, it kind of involved when do they contact the school counselor versus the community 360 counselor. And basically, um, you're, the on-site school counselor can deal with you know, academics, um, change of class, that sort of thing, um, and social emotional, um, college advising, although they do have college counselors, um, but if your child is having most, it's mainly social emotional issues and they're really needing extra support, that would be a great time for you to reach out to the center. And the way that you would do that would be, you would go to our website, which is community360.me. And then what you're going to do is you're going to click on make an, or you're going to, excuse me, click on appointments. And that's going to take you to the appointment page where you will click on your child's school. So every school is listed and you click on your child's school and then you click on register now and a calendar will pop up and you pick the day that you're hoping to get an appointment for your child. And then you select a time and then you're all set. Um, in order to make an appointment with your on-site counselor, uh, the best way to do that would be to email them directly and you can set it up that way. I, I think parents and students are sometimes unsure when should I reach out? You should reach out if you're feeling that you need somebody to talk to and you're feeling support. Really, I mean, we talk to people who are struggling with all sorts of things. There's no real wrong time to reach out. So, you know, we welcome anybody to reach out. Right now we're seeing parents, staff, and students. So if you're feeling like you'd like to talk to somebody about anything, reach out, make an appointment. By the way, I wanna also um, make sure that everybody knows that our appointments are completely confidential. Um, and the appointments through the center, uh, they range about 30 minutes long. Um, but we really want everybody to know that it's completely confidential. Nothing that's said in that uh, meeting goes anywhere. And those are open to anyone in the district, correct? Correct, yeah. Absolutely. Um, what about academic support? If, if they're, they're feeling like they need some tutoring and things like that, do you know where they can yeah, go? Yeah, what's so great is if you go to the same website, um, the community360.me, at the top of the page, there's a, a place for tutors. You're gonna click on tutors. And then you're going to scroll down to the subject that your student needs help with. It's also kind of divided up by subject and, and grade level. You're going to click on the subject um, and grade level that matches your student. And then the calendar is going to pop up and you can pick a day that you would like to schedule the tutoring for your child. And then a list of times will pop up. It's pretty, it's pretty user friendly. And those appointments um, are with all of our high school students who are offering tutoring. They're earning their community service hours by doing that. So it's a great resource. And the tutoring sessions are 30 minutes long. Great, thank you. Um, had a great question here. The, the, the question was actually, my son likes to be in his room before the pandemic. Now he's in there all the time because of school, homework, video games. How can I constructively get him out without a fight? And I, I just liked how that question was phrased because I think you know, as parents, we sometimes all come across that where you, know, you feel like all you're doing with your kids is, is arguing. Any this is the thing. It may be a fight, right? Your kids have, you know, they're, with the pandemic, the kids are used to being able to be locked up in their room, being on their computers, gaming, what have you. So it may be a little bit of a fight. But as a parent, that doesn't mean that you have to lose your, you know, lose control or lose your cool. And some ideas um, that we have to get your child out of their room, you might want to set up a rule that there's no eating in your bedroom. So any meals that you want to have, you have to, you know, come down to the common area to eat or try having family meals together. Um, if your child is wanting to play their video games all the time or it's their time to play video games, whatever screen time you have determined um, is reasonable for them, have them play the video games in the common area, in the family room, in the living room, or the rest of the family is around. Um, so those are just a few ideas. Mona, did you have any other ideas of well, a parent? Yeah, when the pandemic first started, it, what we were seeing is especially older kids they it would they were like bears in a cave they would creep out to the kitchen get food go right back in their room and basically they were in their room constantly and even the kids knew that that really wasn't the best and so um just sort of slowly getting them out and um, eating not in your room, it's not a punitive thing. It's really just an opportunity to three times a day or more 
um, for those of us who've had the COVID-19 issue, uh, <laughs> stacking. Anyway, a uh, little bit of humor there. Uh, but just really trying to, trying to get those kids out, out of their room is, is, uh, is really an important piece of the puzzle. And, um, and with the screen time question that we've kind of talked about, I really like it when the adults who are in charge at the house or the adult kind of decide, like having a conversation of what is reasonable in that family and what's gonna work so that it kind of starts with the adults figuring it out and then talking with the kids. So some people might feel eight hours is fine and then other people might feel, you know, only a couple of hours is, is workable. Um, our website, there's a lot of resources and one resource that there was a question about was the crisis text line, which is a great resource. Um, I actually had the good fortune of meeting someone who was trained to work on the crisis line. They were actually an AC cell parent and they explained their training and how they're really readily able to um, forward people to the correct resources. And the crisis text line is 741-741, which is easy. And then you text the word home and that gets a conversation going with a person who is there to support you warm and welcoming. And another important line is the suicide prevention lifeline. I have to look down, it's 800-273-8255. And all, uh, there's so many other resources on our website and actually Nicole and I are in the process of you know, maybe adding some more resources in, in it within the next um, month or so. So, uh, all right. That's Real briefly, Richard, one thing I would say is that, you know, for those parents who especially have high school kids, remember developmentally, they're at a stage of differentiation and individuation. That developmental stage that they're going through says, I want to pull away from you and be more autonomous and on my own. Too often parents shame and guilt their kids for being in the room. And I'll go back to leveraging again. I love that you love your room. I think it's wonderful that you like being home in a cozy environment and you're not out on the street and you're not getting high in the parking lot. I love that you love your room, but here's what we're gonna do. For every hour you spend after five o'clock participating in the family, I'll give you two in your room. It's pretty simple. So I'd love you to be part of our family for that hour for dinner. And then you have two in your room and then at seven, eight o'clock, you come out and spend 30 minutes with us and you get another hour and a half on your own. So I'll make you a deal. So now I'm not, I'm not, there's not as much guilting or shaming or my agenda, but I know developmentally where you are. And as a, the leader of the family, as Monica was saying, uh, Nicole was saying, I, as the leader of family, want you to participate at some level. So let's make a deal. It's a little bit different if it's a grade school kid. But with your high school and later middle school kids, you've got to remember they're differentiating in two thirds of the world at 14, they are married. It's unusual for our kids to stay home at 18 to 20 developmentally. So how do we bargain with them and make it attractive to participate in our family life? Okay. I, 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 I'm gonna add one more thing and I love these answers and I'm actually gonna use them for my own kids to be honest with you. But the other thing that, that, that I recommend, one more thing is we, we know kids want to please us. So they want to please their parents, whether they, they say that or not. So I, would, I wouldn't even focus on being in the room. I wouldn't bring it up on the time, all the time. You're in your room too much. Get out of your room. I wouldn't even bring it up. I would reward them with compliments when they're out of their room. When they come out of the room, uh, boy, the, the family is so much more lively when you're out here and just little things that make them feel really good to come out. So you're not, you're not stressing what they're doing wrong, but you're really, really letting them know how much of an impact they have when they're out with the rest of the family. And, and like I said, they want to, they want to please their parents. And sometimes they'll hearing those compliments will make them come out more. But remember the double bind for them, doc, is that pleasing their peers and pleasing their parents sometimes are in conflict. And, and ideally, as a parent, we set them up to win on both sides. Yeah. And that's what I like you just said. You know, they can please their peers by being in the room and talking, but they can also experience pleasing us at the same time. They don't have to choose. 
it's interesting that you say that we find that in the classroom too. They, they want to please the teacher, but then they've also got their peers around them. And sometimes those are in conflict, you know, and, and as the, as the adult, we have to be the one to sort of understand that and manage that. Um, so the last question in, in this section that, that was raised was if, uh, if the, if your students having trouble academically, who should you reach out to? Who should you talk to? And what I'd like to say about that is I would encourage you first and foremost to, to reach out to your teacher. If your students in elementary school or middle school, you as the parent, it's a great idea for you to reach out to the teacher, email, a phone call, my student's struggling, my, I had this question, uh, I was wondering about this. Those are great ways to initiate their conversation. Once they get into high school, I'd suggest asking your student to first and foremost try and reach out on their own. Again, it's, it's forming that independence, helping them to, to, to form that, to, to develop that independence. If they're really having difficulty with that, then you can step in. Or if they're not getting the results, maybe you can step in. But I would really encourage parents at the high school level to encourage their students to reach out for their teachers if they're having trouble through email, through, they, you know, through the through phone. But I'd, I'd like to encourage everyone to, to really use the teacher as a resource. You know, we spend a lot of time with your students. We get to know them. We care deeply about them. Um, and we're in contact with Mona and Nicole and the counselors at the school. And we're talking about your students and saying, hey, how can we help this student? So engage us in that conversation. We can be a tremendous resource for you. And I think sometimes that gets lost uh, over the course of the year and we forget that. So it's, it has been a challenging year for everyone. And we're experiencing that too, as teachers, as parents, um, as peers. Um, so please reach out to us. Let us know if your student's struggling. Let us know if, there's, if, if your student's going through something that, that is affecting their schoolwork or affecting their social emotional uh, well-being so that, that we can help and either get you to the proper resource or at least be sympathetic to that. Um, sort of switch now to, so where do we go from here? And, and one other thing I'd like to say, uh, Mona gave us some numbers and stuff. We're gonna recap those at the end of this and let everyone have those numbers again for those resources you can reach out. So if you missed one or two of those numbers, we'll give them to you again at the end. But, but where do we go from here? What does the future hold? We're reopening the schools. Uh, next year, we're looking at a full reopening. What's that gonna look like? Uh, what's travel gonna look like? What's vaccinations gonna look like? What are we thinking about this? Dr. Brown, can we start with you? And what, what are you anticipating for this spring and summer as far as travel goes and safety around that? So let's talk about travel first because there's a lot of topics here. And we're gonna differentiate travel when you're vaccinated and travel when you're not vaccinated because obviously kids right now are not vaccinated. Um, especially with summer coming up, there's a lot of questions about travel. If you're vaccinated, and some of you may know this, but I want to just go over it in the beginning. If you're vaccinated and travel in the U.S., you do not need to be tested before or after travel or quarantine after travel unless your occupation or school requires it. If you travel outside of the United States, you don't need to get tested before you travel unless your destination requires it. For international travel, a little different. You do have to show a negative test result before boarding a flight to the U.S., and you should get tested three to five days after international travel. You do not need to self-quarantine after arriving back in the US. Um, one of the more common questions I get is, what do you do with kids since they're not vaccinated? We know on April 2nd, we just talked about this, the CDC announced that people who are fully vaccinated can travel safely with the United States with low risk to themselves. That's great news. But what does that mean for kids, most of whom are not yet able to be vaccinated? The CDC's travel guidelines haven't changed for those who aren't vaccinated, which means non-essential trips are still discouraged. But we know people still want to travel. You may want to travel. And if you do, you must remember this. Not all travel is the same when it comes to risk. Where you go is important and how you get there is important. Where you go. Going camping or staying in an Airbnb is different than staying in a crowded hotel or, go, or going to a crowded Disney World. It will be harder to physically distance yourself from others and can't guarantee others will be masking and how you get there. In terms of exposure, car is the safest. Being in a plane, train, or bus will put you much closer to other possibly maskless individuals. Even riskier is the need to be in an airport, train station, or bus station if you're planning to take some of those modes of transportation. We realize it's a hard decision whether to travel with your unvaccinated child. We also know some family, families may be more comfortable traveling than others. So it's something to consider in helping you make this decision whether to travel or not. Children are at lower risk for infection and severe illness. We've said that. So if they're healthy and without underlying medical conditions that put them at high risk for a severe disease, 
If your child's in an age where you can rely on them to wear a mask, keep their distance from other people and wash their hands, then it's reasonable to consider traveling as long as you continue to follow the CDC's guidelines. If you decide to travel and understand the risk involved, there are things you can do to make the infection with COVID less likely. If you must travel by plane, for example, book a direct flight. Do your best to avoid crowded areas in the airport. Before you go somewhere, look at infection and variant rates at your destination. If they're on the rise, your risk also increases. When you're on a plane, don't take your mask off to eat at the same time a person is sitting next to you is doing the same. Stagger it. And consider your, your return too. If your child's going to sleepaway camp or summer school after you return from your vacation, it's not feasible to quarantine them at home for a week. Consider waiting. Unvaccinated travelers are advised to self-quarantine for a week after, after return or 10 days if they aren't tested on day three to five upon returning. Whatever you do, remember that no vaccine gives 100% protection. So when you travel, keep masking, keep distancing, avoiding crowds, washing your hands. The bottom line this summer, be creative, but be cautious. And a follow-up question to that, um, that I know some people have asked me personally. If you have a group of friends who are all vaccinated, can you gather together without a mask? Is that safe to do so? It's a great question. And, and why don't we talk about a little about that, about what you can do uh, once you're fully vaccinated. So what can you do now you're vaccinated? And it's an important question. It's important to remember that once we're fully vaccinated, we aren't fully safe. We know the vaccine is one tool in the toolkit, but even if you're fully vaccinated against COVID, you must continue taking precautions by going back to the fundamentals. We just said it, wearing a mask, distancing. I'm gonna say this all night long because we need to still do it. You're wearing a mask, distancing, frequent hand washing, avoiding crowds, avoid poorly ventilated spaces. There are several activities that vaccinated people can resume now, low risk to themselves, while being aware of the potential risk of transmitting the virus to others. The question I get is, what can you do? And I just got it. What can you do now that you're vaccinated? You can be indoors with fully vaccinated people for, for small gatherings without wearing a mask or distancing. You can be indoors with unvaccinated people of any age from one household, that's important, without masks or distancing, unless that household has anyone who has an increased risk for severe illness from, from COVID. For example, fully vaccinated grandparents can visit indoors with their unvaccinated healthy daughter and her, un, and her healthy unvaccinated children without wearing masks or physically distancing, provided none of the unvaccinated family members are at increased risk of severe disease. If they are at risk for severe disease or if there's more than one household with unvaccinated people, all attendees should take precautions, including, we just said it, wearing a mask, staying six feet away from each other and visiting outdoors. Now, speaking of risk, I wanna list for you some of the conditions which would put someone in the high, ca uh, high risk category. And there's a lot of them, but I'll go quickly. Cancer and history of cancer, chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, that's asthma, that's cystic fibrosis, dementia, both types one and type two of diabetes, Down syndrome, heart conditions, including high blood pressure, HIV, uh, immune compromised states from inherited conditions, from use of, of steroids, from other immune, uh, immune weakening medicines, liver disease, being overweight or obese with a BMI of 25 or higher, pregnancy puts you at high risk, sickle cell disease, smoking, organ or bone marrow transplant, stroke and substance abuse. So we talked about travel, um, but what can families do if parents are vaccinated but kids aren't? So reduction of risk doesn't mean elimination of risk. Masks remain an important part of continuing to reduce the risk. And the best thing to do, outdoor activities. They represent a really low risk of infection. So outdoor swimming, you can do the summer, safer than indoor swimming, as long as kids aren't all over each other in the pool. How about exposure? If you're vaccinated, you've been exposed to someone with COVID, you do not need quarantine or get tested unless you have symptoms. What can't you do if you're vaccinated? You can't visit indoors without a mask with people at increased risk for severe disease or COVID. Also, it's not recommended to attend medium or large gatherings. So some of the other things that you can do outdoors besides um, uh, swimming, birthday parties. It's a fun and safe activity as long as kids wear masks and stay outside. Having 10 or fewer kids lowers the risk. You'll need to modify typical birthday traditions that may increase your risk of infection, bat, such as bat, uh, gathering to open presents and eat cake. And if blowing up candles is important to your kids, think about replacing the traditional cakes with individ individual cupcakes. 
and distance kids during any eating or drinking. Also going to parks. Parks are low risk for infection. Bring a mask, find an area that's not crowded. I'm not advocating hanging out with people you don't know, but it's unlikely you get sick from a brief interaction with a stranger outside. Someone asked about movie theaters. It's not recommended for unvaccinated individuals to watch a movie in a theater just yet. Dinners, takeout's still the safest. Next would be outdoor dining and then indoor dining. It appears too risky to bring unvaccinated children inside restaurants just yet, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't stop vaccinated parents from enjoying a night out by themselves or with another couple of vaccinated friends. It's unlikely parent, parents will bring home the virus to their kids based on the most recent CDC studies. So there's, there are some restrictions still and we have to be careful, but there's a lot of things you can do if you can be creative. Wow. Again, great, great information. Thank you so much. Al, based on, I mean, based on it looks like we're going to be moving, you know, back towards, I hate to use the term normal. I really do. <laughs> but back to some sort of normalcy in, in our lives. Um, you spoke at the beginning of this about how, you know, the, the stress of the pandemic elevated a lot of, of, of things. What do you see as we move out of the pandemic? Do, do you think that a lot of these anxieties and stressors will, I don't know the technical term, reverse themselves or, or lessen? What, what are you anticipating from a mental health standpoint? Well, first and foremost, I'll go back to part of the job of a parent is to create the illusion of safety for our children. Just like the flight attendant creates the illusion of safety on the airplane or, and safety must exist in a household for children to sense of love and belonging. If I don't feel safe, I cannot feel loved and have a sense of belonging. That's Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. So we've, um, we've slipped in that area. So I would say to parents, everybody's job is to create a sense of safety. Saying to your kids, we're going to be fine. Instead of don't do that, don't do that. You know, be careful, don't do that, wash your hands. Make washing your hands a game. They showed us on the news, sing ABCs back and then forward. Make it fun. Make it playful. Don't make it a fear-based activity. Get fun masks if they're going to go out. Not like you're going to catch COVID. We're wearing masks because we're going to see who has the best when we go out. When we get in the car, we're going to vote. And we're going to see who has the best. Because for children and those of who, parents who are listening would have kids under 11, Piaget and Kohlberg said for a child, at, under that age, their primary goal is to play. By the way, that's not math and that's not science and that's not baseball, that's not dance, that's not theater, it's to play. So the more playful I can make it, I allow the illusion of safety to be there. When my dad died, uh, my son was three years old. And he, the night afterwards, he was in my room sobbing and crying. And he said, I said, Logan, what's the matter? What's the matter? I thought he was crying because his grandfather died. No, he said, you're going to die. You're, you're going to die. And I said, okay, what's my job? And I looked at my, him right in the eye and said, honey, I'm never going to die. Never. Now, my son is an astrophysicist now. And by the time he was eight, and this is a true story at eight, he says, Papa, you didn't tell me the truth uh, when, when I was three. And how did he remember at three? But um, ha, you told me you were never going to die. And I then at a time he was 10, I had to also tell him, well, you know, that Santa Claus guy that we created for joy and happiness. It's the spirit. So I wanted you to know my spirit wasn't going to die. So it's not lying to your kids, it's creating the illusion of safety. And you as a parent, taking responsibility of that for your child. Now, if you're running around with your head cut off, terrified, scared, and frightened, you can't create that illusion for your child. And as we come out of this, I really hope parents take that on. How do I create the illusion of safety for my child? especially if they're under 11 and 12. Over that, you have to also go with that. Honey, you're going to get into any college. They've gotten rid of the SATs. You live in California, everybody that wants to go to college. And you know what? If you don't get into Stanford and Harvard, it's really okay. I want you to love your life. So how do we go about creating that 
illusion of safety so our kids can experience a sense of love and belonging. That's where really Nicole and uh, Mona at school, they are, they are masters at creating love and safety. Richard, I told you, kids in your classroom, feel it in your classroom. I think the things that the kids have missed most by being in school, I don't wanna mean it like it wasn't literature in English, but they had the illusion of safety and they could experience that sense of love and belonging. And that's what we need to all focus on returning to as quickly as possible. Right. Um, it perfectly leads into the next question. As we look forward to next year, a lot of parents are struggling with what they might do. Do they want to stay virtual until things are perfectly safe? Do they go back? How do they make that decision? Uh, any advice? How would you... I mean, I know it's obviously a personal decision, but as, as parents are looking at that, obviously there's, there's the, the medical side of it and, and that side, but there's also the social emotional side of it. And, well, as socially, said, and one of the things we said earlier that, that for a lot of kids, and, and I do want to point out, you know, the district is working hard to, they've learned from this pandemic, they're working hard to, to create the, the virtual academy for next year. So that will be an option. For, and some kids have really thrived. I've had students that were not doing well before the pandemic, went on virtual and have really thrived academically in this environment. So, you know, I think that's an important consideration from that perspective, but what's, what's a good way to go about making that decision? Well, I, you know, please remember life is a relational experience and happiness of life will be determined by the quality and success of our relationships, not by our GPA, not by the university, but by the quality of our relationships. The biggest concern we have in our offices is, do I believe some kids can thrive academically? They can do it in independent studies. They have done it in virtual, but to what cost? Socially, you learn communication, conflict resolution. As you go into middle school and high school, you learn about your sexuality, intimacy, communication, conflict resolution. There's so many things that Mona and Nicole are helping our kids with on campuses that virtual doesn't do. So if a parent decides to go virtual, they've got to pay attention to the needs, um, the social emotional needs of their kids and how they will supplement environments that will create opportunities because you learn so much more from your peers than your GPA. Mona, Nicole, did you have a comment, a thought about that, about that decision going back virtually or not? I, I, it's really a, a, the, a family, um, you know, needs to talk about it and, and make an informed decision. So, um, but, uh, you know, I do what uh, Al was just talking about, learning how to, um, navigate socially is really important, you know, as kids continue through college and then into their careers. So that is an important aspect, but, you know, I do respect that, you know, each family has their, you know, their own decisions that they want to make. Yeah. And we've seen with the district that they've, they've made a, a serious investment in the 360 center, uh, trying to combat some of the th issues we've seen with social emotional health. Um, do you think that the pandemic, this is a great question, do you think the pandemic has helped erode some of the sting, stigma amount around mental illness? Have we, have we achieved that at all? Uh, that's a bigger question than I could answer. I'm, I, as far as eroding um, the stigma, I'm not sure about that. But what I do know is first I wanna say, um, and I can speak for Nicole too, I think that it has been such an honor for us to be able to um, expand and talk with parents and staff as well. It's been such a wonderful opportunity and people are definitely taking advantage when we first opened up to kind of everybody um, at the beginning of the pandemic we weren't sure how that would look or how it would go and it's actually gone beautifully and it's, it's been such an honor to do. And what I do know is that um, the pandemic, and I loved what Al said at the beginning, 
is that I call it the pyramid of stress and people that we talk with, you know, they, there's different things happening in people's lives, but the bottom layer uh, is that hum of stress and anxiety. And it's called a pandemic that the people of the world have gone through. And then you add on top of it, other things that have been happening in families, loss of economic security, loss of health, and, and so many, many other things um, that it definitely, you know, has been very, very challenging. So I do see on our part that people do reach out and have been um, definitely asking for support um, and just a, a friendly, kind ear. And, um, and I would, I hope that stigma is declining, but I don't know. Maybe Al has a good answer for that. Oh, Mona. Professor <laughs> But I mean, you know, again, being the old man on the panel here and having worked in mental health in the Caneo Valley for over 40 years, uh, Richard, yes. I think even the fact that 360 exists in your school district, it, we couldn't have had it 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And people like Nicole and people like Mona who have sort of softened, softened the ears to make the idea of mental health not only a positive investment of, of time, but how your school district has put the money in 360 and the, the personnel behind it um, shows there is an evolution and an openness to it. Uh, that has, you know, I, in the public or in the private sector, we've just been tremendously grateful for the school districts opening up and integrating mental health care on campuses because y'all see it first. You see those issues way before they come into our offices. You probably see it in your classroom before it gets to 360, Richard. Indeed. Or, or, or Dr. Bromberg sees it in somatized disorders in kids way before it, it gets to the therapy office. A, a lot of stomach aches, a lot of headaches, a lot of dizziness, a lot, uh, so much. But I, I think to answer this question, I, I think the one thing that this pandemic has, has brought out is that I think people who may not have had to deal with many mental issues, mental health, mental health issues before are realizing how much mental health affects every single aspect of our life. And, um, so I think it's making those people who may not have had to deal with it before more accepting of mental health issues and more understanding of people when they are really suffering. And so, you know, even though this has been a horrible pandemic and it's changed our lives and, and hopefully we'll never have to go through this again, there are definitely some positives, spending more time with family, um, uh, learning new skills, um, pivoting as a way uh, for people who are for, uh, in their jobs, or in school, but also uh, accepting more um, how much mental health, how important it is in, our, in all of our lives. Are there any other positives that, that, we, that we can take from this past year? What are some well, of Well, Richard, one thing, from? a lot of people slowed life down. They didn't have to run the soccer field, the baseball field, the tennis court. They didn't spend weekends split apart, one on lacrosse and one at the, the stables. There were some real positive family occurrences when Nicole was talking earlier. More families, I had families tell me they've eaten more dinners together than they have in five years just over the past year. Yeah. They've had conversations at the dinner table instead of rush through and suck down food so they could go do something different. Um, I, I have found enrichment in family life by slowing down the pace is a benefit uh, or side effect that has happened in many of our homes. Um, I also said earlier, the kids who have more social problems and more anxiety or have been bullied. Um, and I also found kids spent time on other things. There was a real social awareness to, for example, uh, prejudice issues in our culture, racism. Uh, there were real concerns for women's issues. Um, even recently, the rise in among the, our Asian community among our population. I saw kids get involved in plant-based diets, uh, th you know, things that they might not have done when they had all their other extracurricular activities. So I think that's been a real benefit also. I, I would agree with that. I think family by far has had the most benefit 
but and, and I don't and I and I'm not joking when I say this, but I think that overall from every grade level, we're talking from preschool through college, I think kids developed an appreciation of school um, mm -hmm. that, that they never had before. And usually by this time of the year, I see it in my office, March, April, May, they're coming in, they're dragging, they're getting ready for finals. They just cannot wait for school to be over. And even good students and, and motivated students and people who love school are done. And they have, have, have partially checked out. And now it's April, soon to be May. And these kids are excited and motivated. And every single time I ask them uh, about school, I don't get it's fine or it's, it's okay. It's great. I love it is, is almost every single answer. And so I think going forward, I think that their appreciation for school is going to be really one of the big things that come out of this. I hope so. <laughs> Um, that's great. That was sort of the, the last question that we that we had about, you know, moving forward in a positive manner. What are some of the positive things we can take from this? Um, before we go back to some of the, 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 the numbers that we gave out and, and the ways people can get help if they need it, is, are there any other issues that, that anyone wanted to bring up tonight that they wanted to talk about? Dr. Tom, did you have anything else on your list? Or You know, I get a lot of questions about variants. I don't know if people want to hear about that. I can talk about that for a little bit, the, 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 the variants of COVID and the impact that's having. Um, can I yeah. spend a couple minutes and talk about that? Absolutely. So it's a topic that's really important to know about right now. I want everyone to realize this. All viruses change over time, all of them. Variants are not unique to COVID. In fact, the job of any virus is to replicate, to make copies of itself. This is how they survive and spread. This is what they do. But when a virus replicates so often, there's a chance it can change even slightly. This, this is normal. These changes are called mutations. And when a virus has mutation, it's called a variant. And these terms variants and mutations are often used interchangeably. Most mutations have minimal impact on virus severity or how contagious they are. It usually means nothing. They're, they're usually meaningless. But depending on where the changes are on the virus, it potentially could change the virus's ability to spread or how bad an infection it causes. As you know, COVID has mutated. And it does so by making changes to the spike protein or the S protein. That's what, what the virus uses to bind to our cells. There are many different variants, but the main ones that you need to know about are UK, South Africa, Brazil, California, New York variant. And it's also important to know that the, that the COVID vaccines were developed before mutations in the spike protein were seen. So these vaccines weren't aimed specifically to the variants. And even though it appears vaccines have lower protection against the mutations compared to novel coronavirus, the vaccines still appear to provide good protection against these variants. Here's how a Harvard Medical School instructor described it in a, in a lecture that I saw. Think of COVID as an elite athlete, the COVID vaccine, sorry. Think of COVID vaccine as an elite athlete, like Serena Williams or Tom Brady. Even if Serena Williams or Tom Brady is having an off day, even if they're facing a really tough opponent, they'll be hard to beat. The vaccines we have, and especially the Pfizer and Moderna ones are extraordinary. They're close to 100% effective and preventing hospitalizations and deaths, and in some way are like the elite athletes I've described. These vaccines, like the athletes competing against strong opponents, can still perform well against the variants. If Serena Williams is 30% less effective than she normally is, she'd win most of the time. When Tom Brady plays a great team, and if, even if he doesn't play well, he usually still wins. The vaccines may not be 100% effective in keeping people from getting COVID, but they're very impressive, even against the variants. So Basically like beating an elite athlete, it would take a lot to overcome the vaccine. It could happen, but not likely. One more thing to know about our response to these vaccines. We've been talking about antibody response for the vaccine in relation to the variants. Antibodies are made by our B cells and that's what most people talk about when talking about protection. But there's another important part of our immune system that helps protect us from COVID after receiving the vaccine. And those are from T cells. And what we know is this, our T cells respond equally well to the variants of COVID as they do to the non-variants. Any concern we have over our immune system not being as effective against variants doesn't take into account that antibodies aren't the only part of our immune system. B cells are important in preventing infection, but T cells are important in, in how severe an illness will be. Lastly, the drug companies are trying to figure out what they can do to combat these, vi these variants. Pfizer is testing whether a third dose gives more antibody response and greater protection against the variants. And it looks like a third dose will be happening. Because it's an mRNA vaccine, they also reformulate the vaccine to give more specific protection against the variants, which are easy to do with mRNA vaccines. 
and Moderna just announced that they're making strain specific vaccines, just like a flu vaccine. The, the new vaccines you hear about don't call for any huge changes in prevention strategy, uh, strategies. We need to continue to get our vaccine and keep doing what we're doing for a little bit longer. And you know it, I'm gonna say it again, masks, distancing, hand washing, being outside and avoiding large crowds. And if we do, the numbers are gonna to continue to drop. We're really only, only safe if everyone is safe. Great, thank you. Thanks for letting me get out there. Question. Sorry, thanks for letting me get out there. It's an important thing that people have a lot of questions about. Absolutely, absolutely. Al, any last thoughts? You know, I would just remind everybody that what our kids will remember is how it feels to be in our home. They're not going to remember much about their math class or their dissecting of a sentence. They will remember how it felt to be in our home. And when all is said and done, that's going to determine how they return to your home in years to come. Does it feel like a sense of love and belonging? Or did we get caught in the malaise of details and forget the feelings are what matter? That's all I would leave you with and say, make it sure it feels like love and belonging and everything will go well. Thank you. And Mona and Nicole, we've talked about the Community 360, the crisis text line and the suicide line. Could we, could we give that information just once more and, and, and so people have that? Okay, well, uh, Nicole, why don't you give them our website one more time and then I'll do the other numbers. Yes, yeah, so our website is community360.me and at the top of the website, you can click on um, counseling appointments or tutoring and you both of those will take you to either tutoring or making a counseling appointment. It's pretty user friendly and streamlined. And I would also encourage you to check out all of our resources that we have on our website as well. Seriously, please, if you are struggling, if you need something, go to that website. It's a tremendous resource. These are tremendous people. Mona? Uh, well, at first, I just want to say what an honor it, it has been to be of service to our community. Um, and I speak for Nicole as well and the rest of our 360 team, Mary Ann Paul and um, Kathleen O'Connell. And, um, and so I want to give you a couple of numbers and then know on our website, there's lots of other resources. So the crisis text line is super easy, 741-741, and you just text the word home and you can get a conversation going and they can sort of funnel you to, let's say you need access to some other resources or want information, they can get that for you. And then also the Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 800-273-8255. So um, again, thank you everybody. It's been an honor to be with this panel. You guys are amazing. It has. I, I thank everyone very, very much. Um, I think this has been great. I know there's a little bit of talk that if people like this, we might do something like this again at a later time. So if you did find this helpful or informative, please reach out to people at the foundation at the district and say, hey, that was great. I thank all of you so much for your time and all of your great comments. Thank you, Rich. I just uh, wanted to jump back in and thank every one of you uh, on the panel for volunteering again tonight. This was uh, so informative, so helpful, and uh, really appreciate that we ended on a positive note. Um, and yeah, again, uh, community360.me. Um, and uh, if you uh, are watching and you enjoyed this, uh, I think the recording is going to be available uh, on the LVUSD YouTube page. Uh, so tell your friends that they can tune in and watch. And um, also please uh, support the foundation. Uh, and let us know if this is a program that uh, you enjoyed and it's something we'd love to bring you again. So thank you all again. Um, really appreciate it. Good night. Good night.